9th. Uh, we are using After weeks of revenue. putting off rate hikes for city services, the Oklahoma City Council was running out of time. The new fiscal year starts next month, and a decision had to be made at this council meeting. Inflation was cited as the main reason the rates for garbage collection, sewage, and water were going up. Still, Mayor Patience Ladding was one of two city leaders that felt the proposed increases were too much at one time. But we could save the citizens of Oklahoma City $3.2 million if we don't put upon their backs at the same time we're putting over a $3 million increase in sewer rates if we were not to add at this time the increase in the water and the refuse rates. And I still feel it's too much to put upon the people of Oklahoma City. I think we should cut back the budget uh, to that extent. As I see it, this is the reason why we're having to have this so-called 30% increase this year is because this council will not stand up and on an annual basis look at what our costs are and increase them accordingly. We have not in the past followed along with the rate of inflation because we recognize that it's not the popular thing to do. Once voting was over, the rate increases passed by a huge margin. Oklahoma City residents can expect to pay $5.25 a month for curbside garbage collection, up $1. The new sewage rate is $1.10 for every 1,000 gallons of treated sewage. And finally, water rates will go up 10 cents per 1,000 gallons used. Officials say don't be too alarmed. Just expect to pay an average of $3.25 or more for city services. Ed Stewart, Action 4. And the motorcycle came, was going north on Overholzer Drive, and where he approached the curb, he was just going too fast to make the curb. Ran off the road and ran off between those two trees up there, then just came on across the road, and the motorcycle and the driver went into the water, and the passenger ended up right there on the edge of the bank. And he was flipped into the water? Yeah, he went into the water with the motorcycle. How deep is the water here? Uh, I'm not real sure from what it looked like with the firemen out there, probably four or five feet. Oklahoma's Transportation Department broke out the lawnmowers for the first time this season, somewhat behind schedule. 45 days, to be precise. The workers have been plagued with wet weather, which has caused the weeds and grass to grow in leaps and bounds. The weather's also been causing the mowers to get bogged down on those few days in between the rain. The ground's dry now, and the tall grasses are coming down, but it's still not going to be business as usual. 
You know, we'd like to get started and mow early, and then uh, usually in Oklahoma it gets kind of hot and dry and the grass quits growing. And uh, that's not going to be the case this year because even after we mow, there's enough moisture in the ground. To, you know, we're probably going to have to mow two or three times this year where sometimes we're able to get by maybe once or twice. Here's an encouraging note from the man in charge of the mowing. If drivers know of some particularly dangerous area of high weeds, just give the transportation department a call. They'll try to knock them down immediately. Sherry Sellers, Action 4. Oklahoma City Police responded to the call at 2200 Northwest 56th Street about 3 o'clock this afternoon after a yard maintenance worker and his grandson found 87-year-old Cyril Orbach and his 68-year-old wife Christine with their throats slashed. Investigators say the couple may have been killed about noon today, but several neighbors saw Mrs. Orbach as late as 10 o'clock this morning. And we saw her last night. My husband was out washing his car, if you can imagine, at, at 10 o'clock, and she was walking by with her dog, and I was out there, and we talked to her. And then he saw her this morning, and that is the last that he has seen her. Oklahoma City Police spokesman Tom Monday says authorities have not begun to draw any definite conclusions as to a motive. We've not been able to establish that anything is missing other than the vehicle. Therefore, we haven't established any other motive. Obviously, if there was something else missing or something of great value missing, uh, we would have an apparent motive, but that isn't the case right now. Police say they still have not confirmed which door the perpetrator entered the home. Investigators add that it does not appear the elderly couple put up a fight. Orbach had formed the SC Orbach Company in 1933 with his wife and son. Orbach's stores are located in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. He is survived by his only child, Robert. Kurt Autry, Action 4. The advertisements say if you love yummy, fattening foods like potatoes, pasta, and bread, you can eat them and lose weight with starch blocker. Actually, they believe the raw bean substance surrounds starch in the small intestine, catching it before it turns to sugar. So goodies such as this, which wouldn't be included in a normal diet, can be eaten. The manufacturer claims the only calories that will be absorbed are those that the body requires to function. The FDA has asked that the diet pills be pulled off the shelves. They say they haven't seen any proof that starch blocker actually blocks calories, and they've started receiving complaints from users. Distributors and manufacturers have 10 days to comply with the pull-off. It appears some sellers may not react at all. As you can see, Oklahoma City's major distributor of the product still has it on their shelves. And the manager here says starch block will stay on the shelves until the company says it comes off, not the FDA. Sherry Sellers, Action 4 at Penn Square Mall. I think if you look across the country, you find that bankers are better educated in banking. Uh, they're more specialized in the, uh, their particular area of banking. And I think the regulatory authorities uh, probably have a sounder 
means of uh, catching or, or discovering uh, uh, bank weaknesses than ever before. Uh, what has happened in that particular case, in my opinion, is not uh, uh, happening in other banks within the Oklahoma City area. Collateralized, say, with drilling rigs. Uh, we operate our businesses based upon the amount of funds we have left to operate on our credit line. Uh, right now, we have those obligations to pay, but we don't know where our credit line is, or if, in fact, we do have a credit line. Thursday, we had a credit line. Tuesday, we didn't. Visions of Fort Chaffee, Arkansas in 1980 is what concerns many residents of El Reno. Here illegal aliens from Cuba were kept until they could find sponsors to relocate them. The federal government would like to build a detention center much like this in El Reno for illegal aliens around the country. Except the 2,000 people brought to the proposed center would only be at the center until they could be deported or have a hearing on why they should be allowed to stay in the U.S. At a public hearing, residents told Congressman Glenn English how they felt about the proposed center and representatives from the Bureau of Prisons tried to explain how the center would boost El Reno's economy. The residents had mixed emotions. We've got a large number of people who are seriously interested in this thing, and I think that they're going to go along with me and the other people to try to stop this. If we can't get it stopped through appropriation <coughs> with your help, we'll give it a try in court and see if we can't tie it up there for a couple of years. The benefits I feel that we'll, that we'll receive from this detention center uh, is not only in the increased employees that will come in, but also the tax dollars that we'll receive as the facility is being built. So I understand all of the contractors' supplies that they buy, purchase, or purchase locally will be subject to the sales tax revenue. Government officials estimate there are six to eight million illegal aliens in the country today. Most of those arrive from Mexico and other Latin nations. Border patrols have been able to stop more of the aliens in recent years, trying to find a better way of life in America. The feds are quick to point out a detention center in El Reno would mean at least 150 new jobs for the city. Officials say they are prepared to settle the matter in court, and they say there are other cities begging to have the center if all else fails. Ed Stewart, Action 4 in El Reno. The files at the Moore Administrative Building have been open ever since a citizens group, Citizens for a Fair School Board, won a lawsuit on June 28th. The group supports six fired school administrators who allegedly filed false expense reports following a February trip to Houston. One file includes transcripts of meetings each administrator had separately with four school district officials. In one transcript, Superintendent Bob Spence asked Chris Bolin why he turned in a hotel receipt for a dinner he didn't eat. Bolin replies, I guess I've just made a big mistake. Later, Bolin says, I can tell you I made a big mistake. I turned in a charge there. I got it at a wrong time for a meal I did not eat. Administrator Mike Ossenkopp admits to being taken to dinner by a book company representative, but he still turns in a Hilton hotel receipt for that meal. His explanation, I made a mistake. One board member says the transcripts show the administrators deserve to be fired. And I think some of the supporters um, maybe for the principals, we'll see things in a different light now. I think maybe they will uh, not judge the board members so harshly for our decision, even though I feel like they didn't have a right to judge us in the first place. I knew what had been said. I knew exactly what they had said. And uh, if I had felt it to be particularly damning or damaging to them at the time, I wouldn't have been so strong in my support of them at the time. And it, as far as I'm concerned, this changes nothing. Now the question is whether this evidence is strong enough to cost the administrators their jobs. That question will be answered at termination hearings during the next few weeks. 
Bill Ross Action 4 and more. Patrol units established roadblocks near McAllister shortly after Truman Norman Kies was shot three times. They were looking for a 34-year-old Tulsa man named Jerry Sherman. Men on the ground checked through the underbrush nearby while air patrols tried to get a better perspective. Late in the morning, they found the suspect's car in a creek near the McAllister exit on the Indian Nation Turnpike. Officers followed the creek's bed to see if they could find the man's trail. About 150 yards away from the car, they found the clothes the man was wearing shot the 25-year veteran trooper. This was not the man's first scrape with the law. As a matter of fact, he uh, is wanted on warrants from Oklahoma on uh, violation of parole right now, and he apparently has jumped a bond. And he, hit, he is wanted. Authorities say Kais went to the back of the suspect's car so the man could get his checkbook. While there, the man attacked the trooper, took his gun, and shot him. The gun was found in the suspect's trunk. Yeah, when he shot the trunk, yeah. after he shot him, he probably threw it in there when he shot in the trunk. That's normal again. Further search of the area proved futile, but by mid-afternoon, the search there had been called off because the suspect had been arrested without incident a few miles away. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4, near McAllister. to put, pick the children out. Roma McElwee uh, represents an Oklahoma City couple which would neighbors. like to adopt a three-year-old boy and his two-year-old sister. The children were removed from their natural parents' home last month. Court records show that Special Judge Donald Manning granted temporary custody of the kids to the State Welfare Department. A few days later, McElwee's clients asked to have custody of both children. Judge Manning granted that request. But the State Welfare Department refused to comply with the judge's order. The agency had already placed the children in a trial adoption home in northern Oklahoma. The DHS said the brother and sister should not be casually taken out of that home. The case became more interesting when McElwee discovered that U.S. Senator Don Nichols had sent a letter to the Welfare Department asking an agency official to check on the adoption request of a certain family. Within two months, that family became the trial adoption home of the children in question. I think the, uh, the timing on the letter is is uh, at least coincidental since it occurred very quickly, very shortly before Mr. Rader and, and his folks appeared before Senator Nichols' committee. Um, I don't know if there was really any political influence here. I think that uh, just seeing that in the file, though, must make one think that things moved a lot quicker for these certain people than things moved for anybody else. The welfare department attorney handling this case denies that the kids were placed in any particular home because of political pressure. And he says that Senator Nichols' letter will be treated just like any other adoption reference. Well, both parties will have the opportunity to present their side in a special hearing before a special district court judge Tuesday afternoon. Scott Wallace, Action 4 at the Oklahoma County Courthouse.
The fire was in the lobby of the 12-story building. It took firefighters no time to put it out, but smoke had still managed to spread throughout the apartment house. Extra men were called in to help evacuate the almost 200 residents. They made their way through outside staircases to those scared and stranded on their balconies, and those just too paralyzed with fear to walk any farther. Most of the apartments are occupied by the elderly and disabled, so special one-on-one -on -one treatment was given by the firemen. They climbed the stairs again and again to slowly descend, gently leading the people to a safe area with fresh air. It's this combination of lots of smoke and lots of people that can be deadly. Absolutely. Not, not from fire so much as from the smoke. So it's not unusual at all, and that's, that's why people die in high-rise fires and in other kinds too, for that matter. Uh, a lot of smoke is produced and the smoke spreads very quickly. And that's, that's our main concern. In terms of, of, of saving people's lives, that's our main concern. That concern paid off at Tiffany's. Only four people received injuries here, three from simply smoke inhalation. One woman was hurt when she fell outside the apartment house. The person believed responsible for this fire is now in custody. She's described as a white female in her 30s. She set other fires at the Tiffany apartment house and is undergoing counseling. Exactly why she did it, if in fact she did, police and firemen just don't know. It'll be some time before a total estimate of damages is in. The lobby area was destroyed, and several of the neighboring offices received at least extensive smoke damage. There are also minor details, like broken apartment doors and windows. One thing is for sure, while building damages may be high, physical damage was incredibly low. Sherry Sellers, Action 4. Bankruptcy is a complicated matter, but in simple terms, it is a little like refinancing a loan. If the debts of an individual or a business exceed their ability to pay, the courts help find a solution. And while there are abuses to the system, it is not an easy way out for a troubled debtor. In general terms, a corporation can file bankruptcy two ways. In extreme cases, they can liquidate the company and try to satisfy their creditors with the company's assets. In other cases, they reorganize salvaging the business and paying the creditors with new incomes. In the case of reorganization, the people who hold outstanding debts become a board of directors, trying to develop a plan that will satisfy them and leave a functioning business for the debtor. There has to be a little element of compromise to where you don't get quite maybe what you bargained for and would have preferred, but still enough to where you're still better off as opposed to the alternative. The ripple effect from the Penn Square closing may bankrupt independent oil companies not on firm financial ground. To some oil industry observers, that could help the industry in the long run. The potential for high return on the investment had attracted a lot of new companies with little knowledge of the field. If they fold, more investment dollars will be available to more firmly established operations. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4. Finding oil and gas in Oklahoma takes a lot of time, money, and effort on the parts of many people. But before the drills start turning into the earth, workers have to know they're on target. Information on drilling locations comes from petroleum engineers and geologists. Qualified people demand good salaries. In a recent survey reports, engineers and geologists working for the state of Oklahoma are being paid far below what is being offered in private industry. The executive director for the Interstate Oil Compact Commission, which did the salary survey, explains why the big difference in wages. When industry perceives this need, uh, it can raise salaries immediately. It can increase them 20% overnight if a company wants somebody. Uh, the, uh, the regulatory agencies are tied to the legislative process and they have, A, they may wait, have to wait as much as two years to get an increase until they come back and the, run through the budget process, and B, the legislature may not give it to them because, uh, because of the snowballing effect it would have on all state salaries. Here's an example of how wages differ. With 10 years experience as a petroleum engineer or geologist, state agencies pay about $34,500 a year while industry pays $56,000 for the same job. 
Joe Gamino has been a geologist with the state of Oklahoma for 18 years. He is well aware of the wage difference between the state and private firms. Gamino says state lawmakers did vote to increase salaries, but not nearly to the level of other companies. He feels working for the state has one major selling point private companies don't offer. A geologist works for the state, any agency, highway or anything. He's not going to be transferred to Billings, Montana tomorrow or uh, Timbuktu. He knows his job's going to be out of Oklahoma City, and he's got a lot of stability there, uh, which unless you're with, even with a large company, you're subject to a lot of transfers. And that was one reason I stayed too. The IOCC is hoping lawmakers in all oil producing states try to be competitive when it comes to salaries in order to hire and keep good employees. Ed Stewart, Action 4. There will be a considerable uh, interest in taking the uh, aged, aging mm -hmm. people out from under the Human Services Department, perhaps, and creating a separate agency for it. Also, probably, there will be considerable interest in taking uh, the uh, juvenile division out from under the Human Services Department, creating a special agency there. And there are numerous others which, uh, which will be discussed and looked at, and probably uh, effort will be made to, uh, to take them out. But Monday's Muskogee Phoenix and Times Democrat says Governor Nye was informed by letter of questionable purchasing practices by the Department of Human Services. A report by State Auditor Tom Daxon has accused the department of systematically manipulating bids. The paper says the Board of Public Affairs detected irregularities in Lloyd Raider's purchase of heavy equipment from the H&C Equipment Company in Raider's hometown of Hinton. Nye was designated to have received copies of three letters between the board and Raider, alleging that Raider was breaking the state's bidding and contract laws. I talked to Governor Nye at a Democratic forum in Norman Monday evening, where he was the featured speaker. He had these comments about the article. Well, my reaction is that uh, we received a letter some time ago from people in the Muskogee area that were concerned about uh, equipment purchasing and also noticed it in the newspaper on account of people who were concerned about this particular uh, purchase. We, we forwarded the information to the Board of Affairs, to the purchasing officer, and told them to make sure that everything that was being followed was being followed correctly and under the law. 
So I would think that any any questions concerning it would have to be given to the uh, Board of Affairs and to their purchasing officers, because we just simply referred the information to the board, to the purchasing officers, and said, make sure that these are correct. It's the political season, and all these uh, audits seem to be coming out of Mr. Daxon's office. Do you find that to be just a coincidence, or do you think there's something behind it? Well, I don't ever like to judge another man's logic. Uh, there are a lot coming out right now, but if he's just now getting to them, I guess that's his business. Well, do you think he's just now getting to him, or do you think it's planned this way? I have no way of knowing. Del Ross, Action 4 in Norman. Uh, there are a lot coming out right now, but if he's just now getting to him, I guess that's his business. Well, do you think he's just now getting to him, or do you think it's planned this way? Uh, I have no way of knowing. I think it's planned this way. Uh, I have no way of knowing. Del Ross, Action 4 in Norman.